What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of JAR. JAR, for those of you that may be new, stands for Joe. And Amy. <laughs> Review. Uh, this is our weekly show where we go over the magic stories as they are posted on Wizards' website. We'll get to that at the end. Um, this week, we are talking about The Hour of Promise by Allison Lures. Um, my quick review at the beginning is, read this story. Go read it. It was amazing. It was incredible. It was everything that you want out of a story spotlight card. It was everything that you want. Yeah. No, it was absolutely amazing. It, it, it could bring a tear to your eye. It could, um, make you worried. It could, it could make you have all these different emotions. Um, there was suspense. There was drama. There was... Yeah. There was character development of characters that we had barely met, um, and it was amazing. So, uh, yeah, this was and a really, big really good one. and characters we already knew. <clears throat> Correct. So, uh, definitely go read this one. It is worth your time, and then come back here, because, as we always say, we review, we do not summarize. Yes. So, on to the full review itself. Uh, awesome. I mean, first of all, obviously, obligatorily, because we brought it up every other time, at least recently, Allison Lure's putting in all the work uh, and doing an amazing job. As in, always. In no way faltering. I mean, you know, there was that break last week with Michael Yi Chow, which is fine, because um, that story was also amazing. Oh, my God. Uh, but, but Allison I, I just... Wish that he was still around to write more stories. I, I mean, he's still technically there, but th this was... One of his last ones, I think he said that um, Wizards of the Coast going to Pride Weekend um, to the Pride March was his last event with Wizards of the Coast. So I don't know when his last day is. I, I, I don't have that that much of a follow on him, but... You're not his bestie. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm genuinely <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but yeah, no, it, you know, he Michael came in last week and, and did the story that he did, and it was awesome. And then Allison came in this week right back into it and, and killed it once again. So, uh, awesome, awesome job to Allison. Um, yeah, so this is the Hour of Promise. This is the third of five Story Spotlight cards. This story, this, this um, set so far, Hour of Devastation, in my opinion, has not disappointed with a single Story Spotlight. And I've been saying that about them in the past, where it was like, eh, this one kind of fell short. Right. And I this just... particular story, Spotlight, shouldn't have been a Spotlight. Right. Um, or it was two story Spotlights in one story, and one kind of got swallowed up. This is not the case. And these are each being given their own story. They're each being given their own time. And, you know, this one didn't actually show us the card at any given point. But the whole thing was pretty much the hour of promise because it was the, um, the locusts controlled by the locust god eating their way through from the outside and the inside, clearly, uh, the Hecma. And they kind of talked a little bit about, and I, I really liked this, the concept that, you know, these scriptures, the way that they were written, all of these people believed in these promises, if you will, that were being made to them of, you know, and the gate to the afterlife will open and uh, the, the God Pharaoh will show up and he will tear down the Hecma for it will no longer be needed. It's like, technically those things happened because right. scripture is vague and, you know, the, the, the Luxa will run, the, the waters of the Luxa will run through the wastes. Well, they did. They ran out of Amenket through the wastes because the Hecma was gone. Like, that's amazing. An amazing way to basically have the Wizards uh, story team have written their own scripture. But not only have written their own scripture, have written their own scripture and come up with their own pseudo-religious text that has a double meaning. And you get to see the double meaning. You see the belief and then what it is in actuality and in practice. Right. Which is amazing like that's so cool to me that that's how that works out um i think it was so well done and i think that hapatra pointing that out to us in this story or pointing that out to the other viziers in this story was awesome it was it was very very cool and hapatra i just mentioned her name i didn't talk about it in the beginning um, she's a badass 
She's not only is she a badass, but I think Allison's a badass. Again, this is another instance of here is a character, right? We saw her depicted in the cards, and technically she existed in the earlier story with uh, Chandra and Nyssa, who showed up to the Trial of Strength area, and we're talking to her a little bit, but there was no character development there. She was just a body for them to have spoken to, to have told them these things. She could have just as easily been like a sign on a wall, and it would have imparted the same information. Now we see Hapatra, and we learn about Hapatra, and we get to, again, see the character development of Hapatra while she is watching the Hour of Promise. And the Hour of Promise is being described to us through Hapatra and through her experiences and things like that. I, I don't know about you. I, I thought that that was absolutely awesome hmm. and perfect. Um, I thought that it was another way. We haven't talked about it a lot on this show because I have my own opinions on it. And I'll share them with all of you. That's fine. But there are a group of people in the magic community, and I think based on they, their degree of vocalization of this opinion, it may seem like they are the majority, but there are a large group of people, it feels like, who do not like the constant focus on the Gatewatch, who do not like those five characters getting all of the screen time, if you will, yeah. in these stories, and, and in sets as Planeswalker cards. I 100% agree with the Planeswalker card portion of it because I think that it gets old after a while. Um, I liked how they mixed it up with Nyssa in Amonkhet having two colors, but I think that a lot of people have a problem with, you know, there were three or four Gideons in Standard and one of them mentioned that you get a benefit if you have a Gideon Planeswalker. There were, I think, six Nissas in standard or something ridiculous. That's crazy. Between yes, between And that's um, coming from somebody who's a <laughs> gigantic Nissa fan. Yes. And I think that's between Planeswalker decks, you know, the introduction of Planeswalker decks and the cards in the sets the in and of themselves. And sure, there are a lot of sets in standard right now, but or you know, and a lot of blocks even, but what, three, four blocks having six Nissas? Yeah, that's that's just... so many. That's, that's so many. That's that's clearly a problem in terms of the gameplay. Yes. And I, I even I, like I don't care how much research and development you did, how much time you spent sitting there at tables figuring out whether it was gonna be an issue or not, it's an issue. Right. Even if it doesn't seem like it's an issue, it's somehow an issue. Right. And so with that vocal group whether it be a majority, a minority, or about 50-50, whatever. With the, the, that group saying, hey, come on, this is a little ridiculous now, it seems that not only, because Mark Rosewater has said it on many an occasion, that <clears throat> they promise to kind of fall back on that a little bit, and that you won't see as much of a focus on the Gatewatch 5 in card form, and... In these stories, towards the end of Amonkhet and into Hour of Devastation, I am noticing that as well. Whether that is intentional or not, I've been noticing it. You hear about the Gatewatch and the things that are going on with the Gatewatch, but you hear it from other characters. When the fifth story spotlight Gideon's intervention was happening, you heard it from Samut's perspective, and, and Jeru as well. Now that you're hearing the Hour of Promise, and you even see, we even saw Solemnity, which in and of itself was not um, a story spotlight card, but it depicts Gideon kind of mourning over Oketra's body. That is not a story spotlight moment, but it is a big moment, and it was the culmination of the story, and it was kind of the, the again, as Amy specifically put it, gut-wrenching moment. Um, you heard that from Hapatra's perspective, yeah. not Gideon's. Will we maybe hear Gideon's perspective on I it later? I assume we will. And I, I, I hope we do, because that was a big part of the beginning of the story of Amenket, was Gideon struggling with other gods. Yeah. And coming from Theros with gods and hating those gods, to now being on Amenket, seeing these gods 
loving them originally, specifically Oketra, coming to, I don't want to say hate, but coming to realize who the gods were, or at least in his opinion, without before realizing that um, Bolas had corrupted them and it wasn't really their fault, and now coming to, Oketra is dead now, and Gideon is mourning her loss, yeah. just as all the other citizens of Amonkhet were mourning her loss. Um, you know, and again, we had another story where Hapatra weeps. I feel like that's been both weeks now where it's been, you know, and so and so wept, right? Okay. It was Ronus last week. It was Hapatra this week. And I think they were both equally as impactful. I feel like if it happens in the next story and the next story, like then it becomes less yeah, if so. If it happens in every story, <laughs> it might get a little old. But I mean, we're, we're, we're in, in, in deep, crap right now <laughs> so you know i i get it i i get people wanting to cry yeah no absolutely because and, and you we're know. gonna stay in deep crap until <laughs> until the end of the story that basically. fifth hour where uh nickel bolas finally shows up and does that defeat cycle that we saw you know um of the the gatewatch five because we also as of today as of the release of this story we had the fourth story spotlight card spoiled because the fifth one, again, as of this recording, has not been yet. But the fourth story spotlight has the Hour of Eternity. Um, which shows the Eternals, which as we've seen from these spoilers, are the 4-4 four, four, Lazatep-coated zombie uh, creatures of all kinds. Um, being led by the Scarab God. And just being marched somewhere. I mean, presumably to Amenket, but because we've now heard of Ramanap and, you know, all these other areas, uh, if near and things like that, we don't really know where they're marching if they're not just marching everywhere. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to being able to see all these other cities to being able to see, um, we, we obviously have two more hours left. Um, <clears throat> which does not, I, Amy and I were discussing this earlier, that does not necessarily mean that there are only two more stories left. Mm -hmm. I think we've got a little bit more time, um, especially because Samut has not sparked yet, and yeah. we have to see how that happens or what happens there. Most people's predictions is that Jeru dies or is injured in some way, which leads Samut to become that upset, which makes sense. I mean, that could be easily the moment right. that pushes her over the edge. Um, we, we, don't, we don't know. We don't know what's happening there. Jeru did get his own card, though. We saw that. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, because otherwise, Jeru's resolve was the only thing that had Jeru in it. And Jeru was a big part of the story. So that was kind of a shame. Or would have been a shame. But now he's here. So yeah. that's fine. Um, I, I don't know. I think... Uh, the only thing I'm really, like, still kind of unsure about at this point that I really want to, like, find out more about is why the zombies are going to be coated in the Lazatep. Right. Because both in Egyptian culture, when referring to Lapis, which is what Lazatep is sort of modeled Correct. after. Lapis Lazuli, yes. And in Magic the Gathering, when referring to the color blue, mm -hmm. um, they both represent knowledge. Mm -hmm. They both represent <clears throat> order. Mm -hmm. And I don't really understand how that makes sense then. So I just want to, I just want that little, that little piece of right. missing information. Well, and I was going to say, I mean... In storyline, if you didn't look at any of the cards that were being spoiled, you wouldn't know that these zombies were being coded in Lazatep yet. Right. The story hasn't technically told us that yet, so yeah, but we've still got time. Have. Oh the spoilers yeah. Spoilers have. Oh yeah. So we know. And it looks like it's the God Pharaoh's gift card that is depicting the the Lazatep pouring out, kind of you know like a, a quarry pouring like you know melted uh, magma metal. Um, and I'm very confused by that. Also, because yeah. Lazatep is not a metal, it's a stone. Yeah, it's a stone. Well, it could be molten stone. I mean, it could. <laughs> kind of. 
kind of. It could. It could. I don't. I don't know. Wait. We will wait and see. That was not this story. This story was, hey, guess what? Um, now that Ronus is dead, Kefna and Oketra working together because they now realize that, hey, Ronus couldn't do it on his own, even right. though he kind of did, right? He knocked him down, but... Well, they we, couldn't do it together either, apparently. Well, they did the first time, right? Oketra was able to kill the Scorpion God and right. scatter him into dust. And then the dust particles reformed. Kefnet turned around and got the, the stinger through the forehead. And then Oketra came in to save Hepatra and got it through the gut. So we finally got to see the depiction of the ability that the, the, these three extra gods have where when they die, they don't go to the graveyard. You know, they, get to, <laughs> they come back. Yeah. So we got to see that in storyline which is great, flavorfully, that is amazing, and works perfectly, and sure, you could argue that um, they should have come back to the battlefield if that were the case, instead of, I, be I believe they go to your hand, I, I haven't memorized the cards yet, but I think that's how it works, that if they would go to the graveyard, they go to your hand instead, but um, first of all, anybody who plays Magic would know that that'd be way too overpowered, that they just would never die unless you exile them, um, but yeah, I, I think it makes perfect sense, and plus, it was dust for a little while and then reformed back into the Scorpion God as opposed to just, you know, dust and then immediately back into the Scorpion God again, which would probably just be return it to the battlefield. So uh, I'm okay with it flavor-wise. I think it makes sense to me. I think it's kind of cool, yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to see... So yeah, I mean, we saw Kefnet fell first, Oketra fell second. It wasn't a long time between the two. Um, yeah especially in comparison to, from, from what we can tell, in comparison to Ronus falling, to Kefnet falling. Um, but we now have three down, two to go. Uh, Bantu and um, ha uh, Hazaret. I almost said Hepatra. Hazaret. Um, <clears throat> and from the cards, it looks like Hazaret may be the last one standing. She has kind of been the focus. She was the first one that we saw when she saved the Gatewatch. Um, she was the only uh, of those five gods <clears throat> Excuse me. She was the only god in the trailer for Hour of Devastation. So, Hepatra seems to be the one that they're focusing on the most, even though we haven't really seen her yet Hazard. in... in What did I say? Hepatra again? Yeah. It's so confusing. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes. Similar names, I guess. Yes, yeah. So, Hazaret seems to be the one that we're focusing on, and yet we haven't really seen her yet in the, this set of stories, but uh, certainly we will get there. Obviously. Yeah. Um, so, and we will be able to talk more about that in, in the weeks to come. Yeah. Um, like I said, Hour of Eternity is next, although in the last story it ended with, hey, now the Locust God is in the background and the, the Locusts are coming and eating away at the Hecma, which kind of led you to believe, and, and Oketra I think even flat out says, the Hour of Promise has begun where the, the Hecma is being torn down. So you knew that that was what was next. The Hour of Eternity would be Story Spotlight 4, since it was not hinted at at the end of the story, we can't be sure that the next story is the Hour of Eternity story. It might be something different in between, and then we get to Hour of Eternity. We will find out together next week. Um, but this story was awesome. I don't really have a lot more to say about it. Uh, I think it's interesting that um, Jeru is still mad at Gideon. <laughs> Because even after learning all the things that he learned, he's still mad. Right. He still says, you know, well, they're all outsiders. Let him deal with it himself. You know, because we, we hear that Gideon and Liliana ran past at one point, And Jeru kind of gets pissed off and is like, don't help them. Well, honestly, I feel pretty bad for Jeru right now. I think his headspace is uh, not... It's a scary place. Yes, and well, I don't. Um, I I don't blame him for any of his feelings. Right. To be honest. Well, and I was gonna say when when that part of the story occurred, when I read that part, I thought to myself, you know, I don't think Jeru, like you said, I don't think Jeru knows what he's saying because he was mad at Gideon for intervening with Hazaret about to stab him, but Hazaret was about to stab him based on the teachings of the God Pharaoh, who they all now know are BS. All of them know this now. And yet, Jeru is still mad. 
he was mad at Samut, but got over it because they're but such close the friends. Thing. That's the thing. I, I, he's not mad at Gideon. He's just mad. <laughs> he is mad about the BS that his life has been and yep. the BS that his friends' lives have been. Or not been in the case of the bird guy whose name I'm not going to remember. Yeah, I mean, he, he murdered his friends. Yes. And he has no... He can't feel that he was in any way justified for that at mm -hmm. this point. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be mad at Gideon and whatever. Yeah. Because he needs to be mad at somebody and he can't be mad at Samut because... She's the only one he's she, got. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and we see that mirrored in that last line from Hepatra in this story. And I do mean Hepatra this time. Um, <laughs> in that last line from Hepatra in this story of, you know, the this is all happening because of another outsider like you. And Gideon says, yes, you know, solemnly says, yes. And she says, good, then he's your problem. Fix it and get the hell out. Yeah. And for Gideon, that's probably a huge deal. Because Gideon was the one on uh, on Kaladesh. Why couldn't I think of Kaladesh? <laughs> on Kaladesh, who was very much like, guys, we probably shouldn't be meddling like this. Like, that's a little far. Mm -hmm. Now, all they're doing is trying to fix what Nicol Bolas already ruined. Right. So he shouldn't feel guilty about showing up at all. Right. But at the same time, I'm but sure he's, he's not... To. Yeah. I'm he's sure he's not happy to. about it. Because... Yeah. Yeah. He, it's, he, because he's somehow being blamed for the fact that all of these people and gods are dying. Yeah. So I suspect, I could be wrong because I don't have any inside track, but my guess is that we're going to have a story very soon, if not next week, very soon, told from Gideon's perspective, at least partially, so that we can get those answers. Um, because yeah. I think they're pretty blatantly obvious that they need to be answered or they, that they're going to be. Um, so yeah, that, that seems to be the next step that we are taking is, hey, guess what? We need to know these things. You know, Gideon, we got to kind of hear from Gideon again. And <clears throat> I hope that the story team is not kind of gun shy about going back to the Gatewatch to hear their opinions, to, to kind of go back to what I was saying before. I, I think it makes sense for the Planeswalker cards to not constantly depict the Gatewatch, but I think if you're going to be following the Gatewatch in general, in story, I think you need to be able to hear their voices and hear their opinions. And I don't mind here and there having them be on the outskirts and having their story being told through other people's eyes. I think that's an interesting way of storytelling. But I think if that becomes your default, that's a little a little over the top. I think that that, that kind of goes against your point. You know, you well, I think that because they're trying to make the cards less Gatewatch centric, they're trying to make the story less Gatewatch centric. Right. And I like that because I like the variety. I like the, um, I like the fact that the supporting characters are feeding so much into the characterization of the main characters. Yes. I I really love when something can do that instead of having it just be, well, this story is about these people and, oh, yeah, there's these, you know, extras in the background. Right. And they're just there to kind of help and push the main characters through life. Yep. Um, but we never get to care about them. Right. Um, I, don't, I don't like that form of storytelling. I, mm -hmm. I would much prefer to have the supporting characters actually support. Right. Um, and, and I think Sema is like the embodiment of that in this block because absolutely. she was an amazing card in Amonkhet. She was amazing in the stories and did a great job of telling her story among two or three Amonkhet stories. And now is going to get a spark yeah. here in Hour of Devastation and presumably play a much bigger part in these stories as well to kind of further her, you know, 
I'm not a background character. Right. I right. am a main and character. And that's what she now. deserves. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, whether you think that there's a power level drop between her non planeswalker card to her planeswalker card or not, because I've seen I've seen that Ooh. as well. Well, come on. Her non planeswalker card was amazing. Her planeswalker card is cool, but it is not a three four haste vigilance flash uh, double striker. That card well, was you nuts. Know, <laughs> she was furious the first time. <laughs> Correct. Correct. I mean, she was a heretic. Presumably <laughs> after her spark, she will also be furious, but right. I don't know. Yeah. So <laughs> At least she'll have something real to fight for at that point, and, and instead of just being told that she's wrong and deserves to die, she'll be <laughs> followed by people. Right. <laughs> um, right. So I think it'll... I, I think... I would say loosely, flavor-wise, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not that anyone will care. They'll just be <laughs> mad about the fact that a planeswalker isn't as powerful as just a regular old <laughs> Samut. Yeah, a legendary creature, but still, yeah. Um, I, I, I said that there wasn't much more I had to say, and I realized that then we spoke for a much longer period of time. There were two other things I wanted to bring up that I, I think are small, although if we talk about them for 20 minutes, you can yell at us in the comment section. But, <laughs> um, but I think that uh, Allison Lors is a very unique person. I think she's a very funny person, but also very good at storytelling. She's yes. a great storyteller, a great writer in general. But I think that her comedy comes in to these stories very often. For sure. In no way is that a bad thing. I'm just, I think, in my opinion, I'm stating a fact, but I'm stating my opinion there. And uh, there were two examples of that here. There was a literal flashback separated by lines that, that you know, would usually show passage of time or change in perspective. There were just, there was just a small paragraph in between two, you know, bisecting lines that just, it was just Hapatra telling a bad joke to her uh, trainees or her crop or whatever, the and initiates. And for saying it was bad. I... You thought it was bad. I liked it. I thought it was funny. It was It was definitely not the best pun I've ever heard. I'm, I'm a man who but appreciates puns. you love puns. bad puns. I love good puns. I don't love sure. bad puns. You think they're bad. They're because really good. Because they're bad. <laughs> and because um, I just hate puns. <laughs> and I do not. I appreciated it greatly. Uh, I also think that the little jab at the fact that uh, Khufu, who was the other, one of the other viziers with, um, with Hapatra at the time, at the beginning of the story, uh, commenting that, you know, he was so old at the age of 35. We later come to find out that Hepatra's 34, which I thought was interesting, but... Um, so that's all the more reason for her to make fun of his age. Right. Because people who are very close in age are the type of people who would do that sort right. of thing. But I also think that it's, it's still flavorful. It still makes sense. Yeah. Because all of the, the non-babies were killed when Bolus showed up the first right. time. so he probably is one of the older or right. oldest people right. in and, that city. And I don't know if... I don't know if they were trying to imply there that, hey, in Egyptian times, you probably didn't live past, like, to 40. Also true. You know? Yep. And so so that, that gets thrown in there, but... In, uh, we, as we know, on the planes of, you know, the magic universe, that's not necessarily, we, we haven't seen that, right? People can live to old age. Hell, I mean, obviously planeswalkers excluded because they live for millennia, but, right. but non-planeswalkers can live into old age. I mean, look at um, Mrs. Pashiri from Kaladesh. She was pretty old. She wasn't like old, old, but she was getting there. And um, so, but because of their perception having been ruined by Bolas killing off an entire population, they might not know because they may have never seen someone older than 35 years yeah. old. So to them, it may be, oh, well, you're, you know, you've got one foot out the door anyway. Right. So, they, and, and plus all these people are dying in the trials and stuff. So, right. so, so they who knows? have no real 
um, Concept gauge of age. Yeah. to compare it to. Yeah. They, they really don't know what a true lifespan is for, for people. Yeah. In, yeah, in yeah. a city, I mean, they they honestly just don't. Mm -hmm. They don't venture outside the city, uh, and there's no people outside the city to speak of anyway. Right. Uh, there's just you know creatures, zombies, and, and, and worms, and, and, and things and... that'll kill them. Yeah. So I mean, it, the entirety of their existence and their plane is just, you know, is just the the very narrow scope that they see through, and that's it. Yeah. And the gods' minds were changed as well, so you can't even say that. You know, the gods could tell them history and stuff like right, that. Right, right, because they were, they were, you know, their minds were wiped and, mm -hmm. and history was rewritten and, and inserted, you know. Right. So, so whatever wasn't inserted in there is, is not something that they have right. to know. Right, it, and it either has to be assumed if it is something that they want to know, or they may just not be aware of it as a it's concept. It's not even like they can research things, no. you know, it's, it's not like they can... They have references to refer to uh, in, in really any situation. Right. So, um, but those were the only other things that I wanted to mention about this story. <clears throat> I liked it a lot. I thought it was amazing. As they have all been in this yeah. set so far, I have not had really a bad one yet no. come up, in, in my opinion. Um, and you yeah, can I give mean, us... there was that one part of that one story that you didn't love. Right. Because it was a story spotlight of, you know, Chandra trying to... Oh, that was in that was in uh, That was that in was Cat. I'm talking so, about Our Devastation. Yeah. So, but anyway, you can let us know if you agree with us or disagree with us in the comments down below. We are more than welcome to, to hear you out and have a discussion yeah. um, because we are not the end-all be-all. These are just our opinions. So please feel free to let us know uh, down below. Yeah, we want to hear your opinions, too. <clears throat> yes, and we want you to continue to show off your... Hashtag Worthos Pride. Now, speaking of pride, something that Amy is probably not proud of is this stuff up here and this thing down here because she had this whole nice outfit planned out and then she yeah. didn't get to wear what she really wanted because she had to wear a... What does that thing say? <laughs> Have a very nice day with um, <laughs> this uh, strawberry shortcake character yeah. and butterfly thing. Strawberry shortcake's cute. Uh, adorable. Um, you're wearing a bib. Uh, anyway, so uh, the, if you want to know why Amy is wearing a bib, feel free to check out the video that will probably be popping up on the screen very shortly. Uh, you can subscribe to our channel to find out when more of our jar series comes out, more videos like what Amy had to endure for that, <laughs> more product openings, more drafts, more of all of the above. This has been Jar on Geek For All. I have been Joe. And I'm Amy. And as we always say, guys, in whichever video of ours you watch next, we will see you all next time. Thanks, everybody.